Hello, everyone, and welcome to Creative Live. I'm your host, Kenna Klosterman. I'm coming to you from my home to yours to our very special guest today, Daniel Gregory. Of course, this is another episode of our podcast, We Are Photographers, where we take you to, again, the home studios, living rooms of our favorite photographers, filmmakers, and educators all over the globe. And we talk not necessarily about gear here on this podcast, but about life, the creative life, and what it means, the ups and the downs, um, so that we all know that we are not alone in this creative journey. Uh, so if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe, rate, like, review. We are photographers wherever it is that you listen to podcasts, and we love to hear from you as well as to who you might want to have on. But if you are tuning in right now, we always love to do the shout outs. So let me know where you're tuning in from, whether you're watching on social media or if you are on creativelive.com slash TV, click on into the chat icon so that I can see you and give you those shout outs. So Doug from Indianapolis, you get the first shout out. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, I'm super excited to bring on today's guest. Daniel Gregory is an amazing fine art photographer and educator. He is also the host of the podcast, The Perceptive Photographer, which just hit 300 consecutive episodes. And we're going to talk about that. So that's super exciting. He lives here on Whidbey Island, which is where I live. So that's super cool. And he is one of our favorite educators on Creative Live. So please help me welcome Daniel Gregory. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I want to just start with, again, just saying congratulations on your podcast from one podcaster to another. <laughs> 300 episodes, not just like 300 episodes, but every Monday for 300 Mondays. That's correct. That's, that's huge. <laughs> it is. And it's so it's so weird. I mean, when I started, it literally, it's just it was started as a journal for me, kind of as, a, you know, there weren't millions and millions of podcasts yet. And I started it and it was just my creative process and everything I struggled with every day. And I was like, I'm just going to do this every week kind of as a commitment. And then a year went by and then I hit a hundred episodes and I was like, Oh, that's pretty cool. And uh, we go through that process and it got to be kind of a weird sort of obsession. And uh, it didn't hit me how important it was uh, until I, my little brother died three years ago unexpectedly of a, a aortic aneurysm. And it was one of those weeks when you do podcasts, you put a bunch in the can and then time goes by and then eventually you don't have any. So then you're under the gun to record. And it just was one of those weeks. And my brother had passed. We couldn't get a flight for two days. And, but I didn't have a podcast for that following Monday. And I was like, uh, do I like, what do I do? But it was so important to me. I just decided to spend that podcast talking about my brother and the loss of my brother to hold my Monday streak. So, I mean, even at that moment and the, I think for me, that was really the big turning point in how important it was to do every week. Uh, because as a creative person, life doesn't let you stop. Like you, you ups and downs and sideways, like you said, we're all in life together. And so in some ways that podcast for that particular episode really hit me that, wow, this is important because uh, that is life. And sharing that weekly up and down is really what that podcast got to be about. Cause I don't talk, I'm kind of like this one. I don't talk about gear. I could care less to talk about gear and it's just the random stuff in there. And so, but that first one, that one after my brother were really kind of the two that, that made it really like, Oh God, I gotta, I gotta keep going. And now it kind of freaks me out if I don't have Monday rolls around. I'm like, Oh my God, it's Monday. <laughs> I, I, I am sorry about the loss of your brother. Yeah, I know uh, that uh, we said, shocking when when unexpected um and so i want to talk about a couple of things but yeah. you know family and and the importance of that like tell me about a little bit about your brother or other siblings tell me about daniel uh growing up um were you a creative child uh talk about family yeah so my uh brother was my only brother um and he and i uh were six years apart uh we were uh, raised in Colorado. I was born in New Mexico. My mom is one of 12. So I've got like 120 in the extended family on that side. And yeah, it's crazy. Family reunions, like you show up and I'm like, yeah, I don't know any of you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and now my, like the people who are my age have kids and I'm like, yeah, I don't know them either. Uh, so, but my, we grew up in Colorado though. And, uh, 
my mom was and uh, dad are both creative in different ways, but neither one of them are art, what, what we would traditionally think of as creative. They weren't artistic. So, uh, but my mom was very creative. She baked cakes and all sorts of stuff. And my dad, you know, made woodworking benches and things like that. Um, and, and, but we were always encouraged to kind of do whatever we want. So like, I, I think my mom and dad for Christmas, my, I was probably seven or eight and I got my first little Kodak 110 Instamatic camera kind of thing. And so we were always encouraged to, to, to be creative. Uh, my brother was very creative. He was very into woodworking and like built a boat and built furniture and did decks and just all sorts of stuff. So he was very creative in that regard. Uh, but yeah, but no family's always been kind of, kind of important for me. And, uh, my partner, Lori, uh, and I, our family is, you know, we have two cats and two dogs, which are very important. Actually, the name of our studio is silly dog studios. So it's actually named after, uh, Eva, our, our dog, she's the namesake of the studio. So they're really important in that process. But Lori's a writer and an herbalist and makes all sorts of products. So creativity is really kind of at the core of what we do um, for us. Which it's, it's, it's always cool when you can look back and see that your parents encourage that because that's not, you know, not everybody has that. Uh, but I'm curious what, like if there were times when you were like, oh, I don't know about going this on this creative, well, ev like you said, everybody's creative, but on the um, professional photographer uh, journey, like was there, tell us about how you got to that. Okay, so I started, uh, when I was in college actually, I took photography classes and smart classes and I'm like, oh, this is it, like this is what I wanna do, I wanna be a photographer. And uh, But then the kind of the reality sort of set in and it was like, oh, I probably should get a degree that would let me have a job because I didn't, under, I mean, I didn't come from a family who had that. So I didn't even know, like, well, how would you become a photographer? And, and back then, everything was film. And breaking in was really hard. And it was like, you're photojournalist or you kind of shot weddings. Like, those were the only two things I knew. So I ended up getting an English degree. And then I got a master's degree in communication studies. Uh, and after college, I kind of quit taking pictures totally. I just kind of stopped. So even though I had shot all the way like through high school and into college. And, um, and I just quit and went and got a job, worked in the tech sector. Uh, so I worked in the high tech Microsoft startups. It was the late nineties, early two thousands, uh, worked a bunch of startups. And at one of those companies, I was just like fried. I was just, you know, working 80 hours a week. And I was like, God, I'm just grinding. I need something else to do. And so I, uh, picked up a camera again. I was like, oh, this will just be a creative outlet. I won't have to worry about anything. I'll just do this. And, really kind of got enamored back with actually the old film days. So I started shooting large format. So eight by 10, four by five, the Ansel Adams kind of cameras that most people now are like, Ooh, why would you carry around a 40 pound camera? But I got back into that. So that was really just a creative outlet for me. And turns out I really enjoyed it. I kind of had a knack for it. So I just started doing it more and more and more. And then kind of serendipitously, I worked for a company and got laid off. And it had been a high, it was for a financial company. I did their marketing and high tech work. And I just, I wasn't really, I hadn't been happy in the corporate world in a long time. So I got laid off. It was, you know, and I live on Whidbey, so I got to take a vote and a bus into there. I got laid off. Like we, I walk in the door and the layoffs happened like that morning. It's like 7 a.m. And I'm like, how am I going to get home? Like, I don't even know if there's a way to get home this time of day, you know, but anyway, I took three buses home, get home. And, uh, I, Lori picks me up at the ferry and she says to me, the first thing she says is this is so exciting because now you get to be a photographer full time. And I was like, how am I going to, how are we going to eat? Like, I'm like still in like freak out mode. And she says, no, no, this is it. This is, this is the sign. You know, you've been on this precipice for a long time. So let, let's just go for it. And so uh, she's like, you know, if we have to sell the house, if we have to live in a cardboard box, whatever we do, we're doing it. So I was like, Oh yeah. Okay. So I started thinking about it and I'm like, okay, I could probably do that. And then I remember calling my dad and telling my dad, I got laid off and that, you know, I'm going to make this decision. I'm going to try to make a living as a, as a photographer. And all my dad says is, wow, now you're not moving back home. Are you? And I said, no. And he's like, Oh, then I am 100% behind this. <laughs> and so at that point though, I, I decided to try photography full time. And the other piece in there that was probably the biggest revelation for me 
was I associated being a photographer with taking photographs exclusively. So if I wasn't taking a photograph, I wasn't a photographer. And at some point, just in a conversation with Lori and with a bunch of other people, I realized that what I really wanted to do was make a living in photography. And so, because, I mean, behind me, you can see my bookshelves. I probably have, you know, four or 500 photo books. I just love photography. And so I just wanted to be consumed in that creative photographic space. And that really then led me to push a lot into the education space as well and the podcasting and all the other stuff I do as well. So that's kind of my serendipitous path to uh, getting here. Well, I just, I love that Lori just immediately took that as here's your opportunity because, and, you know, and obviously you as well, but just that is those moments of um, fear and, and, you know, could be moments of fear and panic. And yet when you can flip those to opportunity and seeing it as, you know, oftentimes we see things if we can negative things that happened in our lives as like, Oh, here's an opportunity for growth, transformation, et cetera, et cetera. But it's hard to see in that moment after you've been let go at 7 a.m. and got to take three buses to get home and yeah. your dad asking you if you're going to move home as you know, uh, but, but you, I, I want to go back to that, um, seeing that it wasn't just about being a photographer, but about living a life in mm -hmm. photography. Because I think that'll resonate with a lot of listeners out there. And let us know uh, if you're listening in the chat room. If it does, do you want to live a life of photography or be a photographer? And what is more important? Because I know you talk about, you talk about in your podcast, about photography being the way that we experience the world. Um, and at least for, for you. So can you, can you talk to us a little bit more about that distinction between being a photographer and a life of photography? Yeah. So the, I think the place I would start is there's an amazing quote by Dorothea Lange that says, and I have to paraphrase because it's not right in front of me, but it basically says, uh, the camera teaches me to see. And I think a lot of photographers think they, it's the other way around. Like you see, and then you photograph. And so that, that quote has always kind of really stuck with me because the, to me, the, the gift that a photographer gives the world is their unique way of being in the world and their unique way of seeing in the world. And all the classes I teach and the workshops and the, I'm, the one I'm doing now, the kind of the extended form what I'm doing now is called the meaningful image. And it's really about how do we create meaningful photographs? And what I tell that, I've told that group and what I tell people when I teach is the greatest compliment I think you can give a photographer, I learned from uh, Bill Allard, William Albert Allard, the National Geographic photographer. And we were down in New Orleans photographed. We were actually down in New Orleans drinking in the spotted cat, but we were down photographing in New Orleans. And uh, I, I took a photograph and Bill said to me, I, we were just looking at the back of the camera and he's like, oh, that is so well seen. I wish I could have seen that. And so it wasn't the statement, I wish I could have taken the photograph. It wasn't the statement, I wish I had that photograph. It was a statement of, I wish I had seen that and that was well seen. And that was, really one of the tipping points for me too, to realizing like, wow, when I look at somebody's photograph, I get to see something I wouldn't have seen before. And then that also explains why two photographers stand side by side and they create two different photographs because we literally don't see the same. And one of the other things that I think makes all art so important is that artists are willing, and photographers I put in that bucket, are willing to take the risk to share that experience. So rather than say that, I have fear, angst, anger, love, whatever the thing is or whatever they have in the world, they're willing to say, I'm going to make this photograph, painting, sculpture. I'm going to put it out in the world for others to judge. And if I've done my job and I've put myself into that work and what I truly have seen, the felt, felt, thought and experienced, we're also then judged. And that's the, to me, that's the risk the artist takes where the other people don't. So that, that, that line there is in that. And so in that world of, of living as photographers, living a life in photography is learning to see the world through the eyes of somebody else through their images, learning to find that shared meaning, shared experience. It also is the chance to realize that we're consumers of everything. And so when I sit down and I look at 
uh, I'm getting ready to get Adina Beale's uh, performance review book in, uh, and I'm so excited. She's one of my favorite uh, portrait photographers, but her book's coming in. But to get to sit down and live with that book and that experience, I learn from that. And then that turns into my photography through my experience. And so in photography, by looking at photography, looking at cinema, looking at books, that becomes a part of how I see. And so to me, it's the recognition of everything is photography, not just the click of the shutter. And and I know where that that notion came from. It was, you know, when you when the internet got big and we were all trying to figure out how to talk about photographers, people were like, oh, if you're not creating photographs, you're not working and it's, you know, you gotta be clicking the shutter, you gotta be making work. Well, the other thing is I don't work that way. I'm a slow, pro I'm a <laughs> slow processor for, for photography. My current project took the two things I'm kind of working on actively now, they took a long time for me to journal about, write about, think about, experiment with to get to the point where I'm now creating the work that that actually resonates. And that all comes from all of that other consumption over the time. Um, so that's the... Well, it's, I mean, and it's quite a process. Um, I, I'm curious, there's a couple places I want to go. Um, one of which is, why you said earlier, like, why would you carry around a 40 pound camera, <laughs> um, a large format bit? Uh, but then also you just mentioned too, like long-term or projects that you've been, have been, have taken a long time to get to where they are. So can you tell us about one of them and the work that has gone into that, you know, that might help other people because it's not just, if it's taking journaling and all these things, it's not just the taking of an image. Okay. Um, Ooh, I remind me taken and given later because I do have okay. something on that. Oh, not uh, taken and made. But yeah, but given. given yeah. Um, okay. okay. And so, the uh, the actual relationship of the forty pound large format camera and the projects I'm working on today are actually related across a, a fifteen year space. Um, one of the reasons I like to shoot a large format camera and still do, and it's one of the reasons I still do analog process in the dark room, and it's one of the reasons it takes me a while to digitally edit, is that process requires you to be very present in the moment. And so to work with large format camera, you do all the technical stuff to get it set up. And then at some point it's you and the subject and the relationship together to decide when to click the shutter. But it's slow. It takes a little while to get that process set up. That has translated into the notion that if you're the more present you are, the more aware you are of what you're actually photographing, the stronger the connection is. And this used to drive me crazy with portrait photographers because, you know, I would take a workshop to learn. I had to learn lighting. I had to learn posing, all that kind of stuff. And I would, same light, same camera, same setup, and their portraits were better. I would just look at them, they're the same model, two minutes apart. I'm like, how are they better? And what I realized was they're able to recognize the moment of connection and presence with the, with the person they're photographing and that I hadn't acquired that patience yet to figure out what my relationship was to that person. Um, so I took that little piece. Then I took a quote by Minor White in which somebody asked Minor, well, when do you know to push the shutter? Now, Minor White photographed a lot of rocks and trees and inanimate things. And Minor said, that's really easy. It's when the object of your affection acknowledges your presence. And so when the thing you're photographing tells you it's okay to photograph, that's when you make the photograph. Um, so that large format space of it taking a lot of time, having to be present, and then these notions of connection drive most of my work. So it's about the connection to the environment. So I don't like to make what I call observational photographs. I want you to feel the wind. I want you to feel like you're stuck in the river. You're stuck in the ocean. Um, so it's a lot of that, that component. So the work I'm doing now, one of the projects I'm working on now is that relates to, to that is I'm fascinated with photography and what makes a photograph a photograph. And I, in my own psychology, have made a couple of assumptions. Um, one of which is that what distinguishes photography from other art forms is one of which is time. So because photography requires a, it is bound by time. Now it's either a fraction of a second or an extension of that over a time lapse or a, a long exposure, but it is, it is bound in the physical world by actual time, where a painting is not. A painting is not what happened at this exact second. Now, it could be an attempt to replicate that, but it's not. The other piece is that the photography and outside compositing, outside anything we would do in the digital space um, or compositing in the analog space, is based on things that exist within the world. So 
a photograph, a photographer has to photograph the thing that's in front of them. So those two things are really interesting to me um, as, as the nature of photography. So what I'm playing with now is uh, photographs that are created with in camera with pan movement over t very small aspects of time, but they create a recognizable thing, but everything else is blurred in the space. And so it's this, how do we build that relationship to time? And so they end up looking sort of in the composition, almost like a Rothko-esque painting where they're color swaths of palette with a lot of subtle nuance in them. And the idea is that as you stand in front of these, what will be very large 40 by 60 inch prints, you spend time looking and recognizing the nuance of what's in there by staying more connected to the photograph. So that's my kind of one of my, my big projects that, that pulls that stuff together. I want to go further into this, the concept of time and presence, because the, what you're describing is getting to that moment of presence where there is no time. And mm. so, I don't know, just to, just to, um, what do you think about this type of work and and time in your sort of life approach to life outside of photography? Um, you live on an island, um, you know, no longer in the city. Like, wh how do you approach time in your life? So that's a great question, and I this is something I still struggle with, and it's and it goes back to what I think a lot of of people grapple with is I think we we live in one of three places, I think. I think we live in the past with regret. We live in the fear with future or in the future with fear, or we live in the now. And every time I think about the things that could go wrong, that's a fear-based future event. But right now in the moment, things are good. Things are great. You and I are having a conversation. I'm not worried about paying the bills or any of that. It's this moment. And that when photography works, it puts us in the moment. It doesn't put us into fear or regret, which is where I think a lot of, lot of us spend a lot of time. And so to me, the creative act of anything is about removing the past future elements and getting into the moment now. And so most of the decisions Lori and I have made over the last six, seven years have been an attempt to get more now and less out of the, the fear of the future of the past. And we learn that in weird ways. So my, the namesake of our studio for Silly Dog Studios is Eva, and she got bone cancer a year ago. And bone cancer in dogs, if they don't catch it within the first couple of months, they only have a month. And then they tell you, oh, if we amputate and you get chemo, you might get a year, maybe a year and a half. And well, we dumb lucked in and got immunotherapy and a bunch of things that will potentially give her a longer life. Now you, you have no idea, but she taught me more than anything about now because she came home and once she was off the pain meds and the initial pain of the surgery, she's like, I'm a three-legged dog. Like and I'm, there was no like worry about how am I going to run at the park? There was no worry about where'd my leg go. It was just, I'm here today. I'm with my family. I get to chew on my Kong with peanut butter. Life is good. And that, that really cemented for me a year ago, like, wow, if I, if I live completely in this state of fear and that that permeates everything I do. And cause I'm not a regret person. I don't have a lot of regrets. I just, I don't, this, the past is gone. I always think the future can be dealt with, but the past can't. And so my, mine's a fear-based thing. Anything that paralyzes me is out, out of fear, but she's really helped me realize like, wow, if I can hold the moment, I can do a lot. And what came with that was a lot of forgiveness of myself. I find that I found in my own work and when the work I do with others, when I'm mentoring other people, this is probably one of the biggest things we deal with is we are so hard on ourselves. And I always thought on my hell about, I need to create more photographs. I need to print more. You know, I need to do this more. I need to do that more. When really what I needed to do was I just need to sit here in the sun and make vitamin D because I'm exhausted. 2020 is a less than fun year. And I didn't get to do a lot of things I wanted to do, but I could go sit outside and I could have my cup of coffee. And every morning I could sit out there with the birds and for 15 minutes, I could give myself being present. And then the day would start and the normal world would, would follow, but I could give myself that little piece. And so photography for me is 
uh, the, the word I use is attunement. So when I'm present, I get this feeling and I can feel it. It's in the pit of my stomach or the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I'm like, oh, there's this moment where I feel like I'm really connected to the, the world. And I listen for that in my photography now. So when I know to push the shutter, it's like, oh my gosh, I have that butterfly feeling in my stomach. That means I'm, I'm present enough to recognize that. And then when I edit, when the butterflies come back and when the print goes on the wall, the butterflies come back. And so that's the, the moment of presence that I get back and with the photograph over and over again. Um, so that's the, the I, why time I think is so important is it's in photography, it's helping me stay now so that I don't freak out like I tend to do for the future. You're so like me <laughs> in everything <laughs> you just talked about. No wonder I moved to this island. <laughs> it's, it, 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 um, because I also have that projection, the fear of the future more so than, um, you know, thinking about the past and regrets and that's what causes anxiety and that then, you know, but putting yourself in a position where and creating a space where you can allow yourselves those moments of presence um, makes can, has made all the difference for me. And then that, you know, that influences your work, your art, um, all of it. Uh, what do you still fear? Um, fear. It's a great question. If, if anything, um, you're like, I, I, don't I, I, yeah, I don't know where yeah, to go. I, I don't, I don't know <laughs> if it's, if it's fear. Um, but I do, you know, I, I do believe in that, you know, as humanity, we have more in common than we, than we, than things that are divisive. And I, I, and I worry that or I have fear that we will all move into a forward fear state and not recognize how amazing we are today. And we'll make decisions that won't allow us to be in a great position, you know, 20 years from now. And I, I mean, I love the national park system for that reason. Like we have places I can go that, yes, they still have cars. Yes, they have roads. Yes, they have tourist shops, but I can go look and see kind of what the world looked like. And, and was preserved. And so there's some, some elements that I like about that. Um, I have fears that I won't ever be able to make the kind of artwork that I think I should make. Um, that's, you know, at the same time, that's a driver. Like I'm always trying to make that work, but I worry that what happens if that won't, I think my biggest fear though, the one I don't like to talk about is when I teach uh, photographers how to create meaningful work, I talk about voice, vision, signature, and style. And those, four elements have to come together to really get a signature photograph. Um, and in that is voice, which I define as the thing that you have to say. So it's the thing that you are that you have to say. And my biggest fear is I don't have anything to say. Like that's my paralyzing fear when I like, if I'm not making work, it's cause I'm in my fear space of, I don't have anything of value to tell anybody. Um, and so, while I do have some you know bigger humanity ones for me. That's the, probably the most paralyzing is that I don't have anything valuable and important to say. And yet I look at everything everybody else says and I think, oh my God, everybody's making this amazing work and they're telling these amazing stories and they're sharing this amazing experience. And I like, I know that my fear is irrational, but yet it's my fear. So it's completely rational. <laughs> uh, but I think that's probably my biggest one is it's just, I don't, I don't know what to say. And cause the other stuff, like, you know, like when my brother died, I got no control over that. I, None. So I can't be afraid of that. Like, cause there's nothing I can do about it. That's literally, I have zero, but my own creative process, I feel like I do have some control over that. And I think that's why that, that fear is there is I'll wake up one day and be like, well, there's, I don't have anything to say. And, and it's been bad enough. Sometimes I've probably gone, you know, I don't even remember how long, but it's probably over a year without making what I would consider significant work. So I was just, I was like, I don't know what to do. Like I literally had spun myself into a, into a tizzy that I couldn't get out of. And that was, that was hard. And, and at the same time, I look back at the work I was doing at the time, which seemed stupid and dumb. And it's like, well, that's actually, it was continuing to sketch, continuing. There were this, that was there, but I just, my own brain just shut it down. Bad brain, bad brain. Well, it's, 
I, I don't think that, I mean, fear plays a role in keeping us alive as humans. And yet it can also, you know, spiral us out of control. And so that's sort of the, the balance. And it's like, okay, recognizing the fears, um, whether that's in life, in your work. Um, and thank you for sharing that because I think so many people will resonate with what, with the fear of not being able to, um, of not being able to create, but it's really, you have to like get past that. For me, it's like, I, I'm afraid of not knowing how I'm going to get from A to Z. And therefore I don't even go from A to B, um, in terms of taking those, those little steps. Um, so coming back to then, voice and is there something that was there a moment where you were able to say like well I guess it not that it doesn't matter but like I've got to just start saying stuff to find that voice again or or how do you how did you break through a year of not feeling like you knew what you were going to say um the the I think the biggest thing was in looking at this is where that kind of goes back to that living as a photographer. So in looking at lots of other photographs, I realized that one of the hangups I got was that what I needed to say needed to be unique. And so we live in a world now where there, everything's, everything's been photographed. I mean, we create more photographs in, in a day than we used to create in a year. And, you know, billions upon billions upon trillions of photographs getting created. So there's nothing to, pho- there's literally nothing left to photograph. And that was really one of the things that got me stuck was like, I've got to go create this unique work. And I would go photograph somewhere and I'd come back and I'd be like, yeah, you know, that's, you know, that looks like somebody else's photograph, like from a, just a, you know, I went to Bodie, they photographed Bodie. Oh, yep. Those are the buildings of Bodie. Um, and then I played with the, well, I just have to find a unique perspective point of view where I put the camera. So it was weird angles and weird lenses and, and, and then it dawned on me that it goes back to that, sh- the, my notion of what well, is an angst about humanity, but the belief that we're all connected and that it, the unique, the uniqueness isn't in what was, fo- what was photographed, but it's in the sharing of what was u- seen collectively together so that you get to see my own take on, on that. And that for me was the kind of the thing that spun me out of that was I didn't have to photograph something unique. I just had to photograph my reaction to that. And that goes back to that being present. Like I have to go now stand there and not take a photograph until I figure out what is my relationship to this? What is my experience I'm having here? And what cemented that was I was actually in the Olympic national park photographing these trees and eight by 10 camera. At that time, it was only about $8 for a sheet of film. So I have the camera set up. I go to photograph the trees. It's mid-afternoon, so the, there's this afternoon breeze that picks up as the temperature inversion happens. And then, so film goes in. It's about a 40-second exposure, and the trees, move, the wind comes down. Trees move. I pull the film out, flip the holder, put it in, and I blow through about five sheets of film. I'm like, this stupid wind is just ruining my photograph. No, 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 no. Now I'm much more verbose and screaming and profane at the time. But then it dawns on me, I'm like, well, wait a minute, if I'm standing here, the experience is the wind. And I'm like, how do I photograph the wind in the trees? And that for me was like, that's the uniqueness. It wasn't because people had photographed those trees. It's the Hall of Moss. I mean, it's been photographed hundreds of thousands, millions of times. But my experience of what the wind felt like when I stood there and I was like, oh, that's my, that's me. That's my thing. And so it goes back to that being present. And Every time now I don't photograph, I'm not present. I could tell you that unequivocally that's the problem is I am worried about the future. I am worried about camera gear. I'm worried about camera settings. I'm worried about everything but that notion that Miner talked about, standing there until that thing tells me it's okay to photograph because I have to really be paying attention to that thing, not anything else. And so that that for me was really the biggest breakthrough. And that's the bar I use now. If I'm, if I don't have that experience, the photo doesn't work. And it's led me to, when I work with people, I ask them, you know, where was your head when you took the photograph? Like, what were you thinking about? And if they're like, well, what F-stop? I'm like, that's why it doesn't work. 
I'm like, because a technically perfect photograph that's soulless and devoid of any meaning is boring to look at, but yet a out of focus, kludgy, weird, gross photograph that is just compelling for some reason. So it can't be technical. It can't. There has to be something else. And I do believe it's that we got access to the moment, that presence in the moment photograph. And that's what hallmarks great photographs um, across all of, all of history is when that, that happened. A couple of things in there. First of all, there's this amazing movie from probably 25, 30 years ago. I don't know. I have to, you just reminded me of it in terms of how do you photograph the wind? And it's this movie about a director, filmmaker wanting to, how do I film the wind? Mm. Uh, and how do I, because it's, you're never, it's always what you see is the, the reflection of it or not reflection, but the, it affecting something else versus the wind itself. Uh, and so it's just kind of a, a beautiful, you know, you can apply that to other things in life. Anyway, I got to go find out what that is. Oh, that'd uh, be a great but, movie to watch. <laughs> but secondly, uh, you're, you were talking about the shared experience of an image. And so I wanted to ask again, going back to that taken made given mm -hmm. is tell me about the given part of, of photography for you. Yeah, so this is something that's been is really relatively new in my orbit of, of thinking about photography, and that, and it comes out of I'm I'll be the first to admit I'm a I'm a nerd when it comes to like studying photography. So like, Roland Barthes, Camber Lucida, on Susan Sontag's on photography, all the stuff nobody wants to read about photography because it's ivory tower esoteric. I love I read it all. Um, and one of the things that Sontag talks about is the predatory nature of photography. And so, you know, long lenses, you know, metaphorically simulating rifles and guns and, and the language photographers picked is predatory. We take, we shoot, we capture. And so I was thinking a lot about that. Like at first I was like, Susan Sontag's crazy. Then I'm like, well, actually, you know, we did pick those words. And capture, taken, and shoot are a little abrupt. And so I always have kind of held that in the back of my head. And then I got to thinking about that same problem I talked about in I go, whether it's Joe McNally, Lindsay Adler, Adina, Carrie Mae Weems, pick any one of these great photographers who does portrait work. I'm like, why do they make such great portraits? Like, you know, they take these amazing photographs. I'm like, how do they do that? And so I would go watch and, and look at videos and, you know, at a conference, talk to them or whatever. And, and then I realized like, hmm, they just, they have a different, they still use the same language, but the language behind their language was just subtly different. It's about the relationship. It's about the acknowledgement. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. So I've been processing that little tornado for about four or five years. And what hit me several months ago was the difference between somebody giving you something and you taking it from them. And so if I go up to you and I take something from you, I have, whether it's an aggressive stance or whether you're fine with me taking it, but I still take. Versus you acknowledging me and you giving me something because you believe what you're giving me has value. And so in photography, what I realized was that if we are given a portrait, if we are given a photograph, that I am the receiver of what that person wants to provide. And if I'm not getting the portrait I want, if I'm not getting the photograph I want, I haven't made the space safe and comfortable enough for that person to have that relationship with me. And so that's onus is on me then to continue to build that relationship, to continue to open myself up, to make myself vulnerable, to share my fear, my angst, whatever it is, to make that person comfortable so they can give me what I ultimately want to see in the portrait. And it, in my head, flipped this, it resolved the predatory question that Sontag presented. Um, but it also really changed that idea of what photography, I think, should be about, which is about relationships. It's about my relationship to a rock, a tree, a person. And do I want to be a person who goes in and takes, owns, dominates, or do I want to be a person who actually listens? to the other person. And I think when we listen, that's when we're given things. And so to me, that that's the flip there is, is I want to be given something that somebody trusts me enough to reveal about who they are or what they are. And that's what can make the portrait photograph 
uniquely mine is that it's my relationship to that thing, but I want them to give it to me. And so that whole minor Sontag portrait swirl, that's, that's kind of where I've, I've landed in about the last six months with that. And it's, it's been exciting for me because it really, like when I look at my own photographs now, I think about things different. And the other thing that's goofily changed, which I thought was weird, but then I talked to some of my mentors and they're like, no, that's kind of how I've been doing it for my entire life. You're just catching up. Which is a good mentor, I guess. Um, but the other one is like when I photograph a rock or a tree, I now ask permission to photograph that tree. And then I thank that tree when I'm done. And because I do think that whether you believe trees are sentient or not, it's the me getting myself present, me saying I'm present and I'm acknowledging that can I do this? And the thanking of the time and the presence I got is about my mental state as much as it is whether the tree accepts it or not. Now, I, I'm one of those people that believe trees actually have hyper awareness and are you know, in tune as all living things are. So I have that side benefit as well. I think the trees talk to each other and they're like, no, that guy's nice. You can give him a portrait later. It's, you know, it's okay. Have you read the book, The Hidden Life of Trees? I have, yes. I'm just and, reading it right now. Yeah, I just no, started. Yeah, no, that 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 one is is great because it's also by somebody who, you know, started off not thinking that and evolving into that. You know, it's a it's a wonderful read. Awesome. I'm excited. Um I'm curious about I was gonna ask you about because you were talking about portraiture. I, and first of all, let me take a step back. I love this concept of given with regard to to photography because I've always talked about and the this concept of instead of take it's make so it's making an image with your subject or what have you that it's kind of it is that connection that makes the image but it's almost it's a step further to be receiving the image you know as as a gift I think it's really beautiful um has that and that goes back to like it's not about the settings or you know that technically perfect because that's almost you know that is a thinking approach yeah. versus you know a feeling approach i want to go back to this concept of your your 300 episodes uh and you talked about in that episode uh milestones and you talked about not being somebody to celebrate achievements um, and whether that's, you know, big birthdays or, um, or just things in general, big or small uh, milestones. And I'm, it made me wonder why you haven't historically celebrated milestones. Like, is there something in your past? Um, I, you know, if it is, I haven't thought about what it would be. Lori loves to celebrate milestones. So we celebrate them because Lori loves to celebrate milestones when they're important. It killed her this year. We both turned 50 this year. And like 50 is a big one. I mean, I'm, I would have been perfectly happy with a big trip on my 50th birthday. And the state of Washington locked down March 13th. My birthday's at the end of March we were like, Oh, we can't even get food. Like, <laughs> so, uh, so that, that, that was, that was part of it. And then I think the other part is just, you know, it is a little, like I said, I, I, I'm fear based in the future, but I'm also optimistic based in the future. And so to me, you know, when I got my master's degree, I didn't, or, you know, I never walked at a graduation except my high school graduation. I, my, bachelor's degree, my master's degree. I was like, well, the degree's done. Like the experience I've had, the walking doesn't cement anything, doesn't change anything. And so I've always just, it's always been that way. And I'm not sure what the root of that is. Um, and, and it's not that I'm not proud of those achievements. I mean, I'm proud of every gallery opening I have. I'm proud of every photograph I have that, that, you know, is, is important to me or sells or, you know, and I'm, I'm proud that I got a master's degree. It's just that actual, tick mark of celebration for some reason just just isn't there and it, it's it is weird i mean i mean i have friends who celebrate like i got to the bottom of a cup of coffee let's celebrate Woo! you know i mean they're they're they everything's a milestone um, so yeah i'm not i'm not sure where that came from well i was because i was thinking about it and i i'm i'm curious if it's like this not wanting to pat yourself on the back or not wanting to like if it was 
thinking that that is a selfish thing to celebrate um, and, and that it's because I, I enjoy celebrating things as well, like little things or birthdays or whatever. But sometimes you might feel like, well, it's I don't I don't know. I don't know if it was if it's this like, yeah, selfish it, and, and that it's not OK to be. I don't know. You know, that could very well be. I mean, I, I there's a lot of in my family, there's some. Uh, amazing celebrations and they get together every fourth of July and do all that kind of stuff. And so I've been around it my whole life. Um, but yeah, I'll have to think about it because it very well could just be it's a. You know, my brain might be a slippery slope from a little celebration to become an egomaniac. So <laughs> could be like, ah, oh, it's going to get out of control if I start down the celebration path. Well, um, that's, I mean, and that's the thing, but you acknowledged in this episode that, you know, that you, I guess, so t tell me about then what the realization was that it was okay to celebrate achievements or think versus like birthday. Yeah, and that well, it kind of goes back to uh, actually uh, something I did with my little brother was passing. So my brother was a Irish whiskey drinker and not a cheap one. So Jameson 18 was you know a thing he drank in Middleton and those high end Irish whiskeys. Well, I he came up and helped me build my analog dark room. Um, it was the last uh, kind of big brother thing we did together. And to celebrate, Lori was out of town. I bought a bottle of Jameson 18. So we just drank for uh, how we didn't chop our leg off with a power saw. I don't know, but. Um, so I had, uh, you know, a little bit of that bottle left. So on his birthday, on the anniversary of his death and on some of his key milestones in his life, I would drink the Jameson 18 just to think of him. Um, and that's where I kind of started to realize like, wow, you know, there's, there's something really kind of cool about, you know, celebrating that now. And I think it was the realization that he wasn't there to celebrate it. And so every one of those little milestones, every one of those little passings, if, you, I don't celebrate those, or if I don't celebrate them with somebody else or talk about them, then, you know, that opportunity may never be there again. And so the, the realization that I won't ever have another Jameson with my brother to celebrate something cool in life, because that's what we used to do. We used to get on the phone and drink together to celebrate, like, hey, raise a glass, and, you know, this is a cool thing or whatever. And so that, I think that's probably a big part of it was realizing that that, that is important, and that if it's not there, and if you don't do it, nobody does. Like, nobody would raise a glass... Well, people do on my brother's birthday. He was very gregarious and had lots of friends. But the that notion that those little things are important. And then, like I said in the podcast, the other thing that I that I think I've started to realize as I've gotten older is, you know, recognizing those milestones is not is not ego driven. It is it is a uh, a recognition of what has happened and the work that's gone in and the accomplishment, not as ego driven, but really as a celebration of, of how cool that is to actually have that happen. And I think about like all the times I've celebrated for other people when they've gotten accomplishments or done whatever that, that it's no different on my own end. And I feel pride. I mean, when I get a print come off the printer and I hang it on the wall and I like it and it looks great, I, I'm excited about that. And, you know, I should be able to share that and tell people that other than just, you know, put it out on Instagram and hope, you know, Five people like it. Like, woo, yay, five people liked it or hearted it or whatever we call it on Instagram. <laughs> well, I think that's interesting, though, this tie between um, the the fear of seeming like an egomaniac versus patting yourself on the back. And, and it that, like, we, I don't know, I, I feel like we don't always celebrate the things that we do achieve in a positive way that, um, allows us to, you know, then keep going and be like, it's, it's great when we do something and can, can look back at that and, you know, reflect on the experience and what have you. And it's, I just feel like we're all, like you said earlier, we're all our worst self critics. We're all hard mm -hmm. on ourselves. you know, whether that's in the past, in the future, I should, I should, I should, uh, where, where, you know, I think just a lot of people can certainly relate to that. Um, yeah, I wanna, no. oh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. I was just gonna say, yeah, no, that that weird fear ego thing is that I think all everybody has. Um, I tell my uh, people I work with that you have to find the thing that annoys it more than it annoys you. And so I, what I've learned with mine is it likes to not, it hates my fear hates to be told that there's something it can't do because it's like paralyzing. Like I can do anything to make you not work, 
And then I'm, so my joke is always like, I, I tell my fear, I'm like, I bet you can't solve for pi. I bet you can't rationalize out what pi actually is. 3.141579, what comes next? And it's like, oh, I'm going to go solve for pi. And it goes off for a little while and entertains itself with that so that I can actually get some work done. So like, you just have to find a way to annoyingly distract it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And that, those are the, you know, those are the yep. tools. Those are the yep. tools. I want to talk just a little bit more going back to the, the alternative processes. Um, the, you know, a, a lot of people are finding coming back to film or um, discovering it for the first time. And you, you, we talked about time and the slowing down, but talk to me about the, the, the nature of, you know, just of that type of alternative processes for you and what that, what you've seen in teaching other people that as well, like the, the joy of these other processes. Um, so in the, in my world where we have time, uh, and, we, and then we have the nature of the thing, the indexical nature of photography. The other oddity in me is that I believe the photograph is it has materiality as well. And so the actual tangible print is the photograph. When it's digital, it's a digital image. It's not yet a thing. And part of that is because it's infinitely malleable. A digital file can be edited over and once I print it, it's committed. And so that's one of the reasons why I love to teach printing. I want to get people to have that experience of the materiality of holding an object. And for all, and that's where a lot of the alternative process comes from is it's the materiality of it. The actual materials themselves are so important to how you imagine the print being because it affects tone and color and size and all sorts of different elements. And so to, to go pick your paper, like I want it to have this feel and I want it to be a softer paper or a toothier paper or a brighter white paper. It's all about imagining what that final thing looks like. What does the actual object that's going to hang on a wall look like? And so we, we pick that and then the time to actually coat in the alt processing world, we've got to coat the paper. So we've got to get out a brush or float it or do whatever we do technique wise, but we actually create the thing that captures the light. Then we put the image on, then it gets exposed. So everything's just slower. It takes eight minutes, 12 minutes. If you're doing it outside, it might be two or three hours. It gets exposed to sunlight. Then we get the print made and then we decide, oh, that's not quite right. And we have to go tweak it again and do it again. And it's the same loop. But it's that my hands are in it. My I'm physically doing something. There's the brush stroke work. So it's it's moved from completely being detached in some ways in the computer to actually a very hands-on process. And when I work with people who come back to, whether it's digital printing or analog printing or alternative processing, that experience of actually doing something to create the image is, is hugely rewarding. Um, and that's the response people get is like, wow, I didn't realize, well, first thing, I don't know how much work this was to do this, but then they say, um, I can't believe how much more satisfying it is to actually have something that I've created to hold and to touch um, um, in that regard. And that's, I think that's what a lot of people are returning back to that process. I also think it's why people are returning to film in droves is, one, you, it's a different medium. Digital and film are different. So we can't ever get them to be the same. I can apply a Kodachrome preset, but it's not Kodachrome. And I can make up black and white analog print, it's different than a platinum print. It's different than a digital print. They're all different. And people are starting to realize that those things are all different. And I also think there's a lot of people who are trying to find a way to get connected back to their work in a non-instantaneous way. That instant feedback, split decision of good or bad. When photography is not about good or bad, it's about an experience we look at and it's experience we feel. And I mean, I'm, Social media is, in many ways, corrupted our understanding of photography as much as it's expanded it because we make a decision on a photograph in less than a quarter of a second. But if you spend time looking at a photograph, you really start to see the nuance in there. And that's the other thing that the alt processing world does. Because you're coding, because you're doing this, because you're having to look at that thing that you created, you start to look at every little brush stroke, every little nuanced detail. So now you're spending time with the image, you're starting to see and understand the photograph better. You're understanding your own point of view better. So that that is the other thing I think that comes back. We've removed that instant 
quarter of a second judgment and we allow time to come back into the equation so that we can appreciate things on a different level. Um, and I think that's, that's the big thing I see people returning for that. Well, I, I just, I love that thinking about the difference of just working on just all digital, all digitally, um, on the computer, the digital camera, what have you, is not that that's an invalid um, way to create and and experience our photography, but it's a just different. Yeah. And it's more the the work that you're just describing, even if it's just printing your work, is it becomes more, I don't want to say craft focused, but um, there's just a different element of the art form itself like you said the physical is different than the digital and again both both valid just yeah, no. just absolutely different. yeah no and I, I it's you know it's one of the things i tell people that if you want to change your relationship to your digital work get a wacom tablet i'm like just the experience of using a pen where you feel like you're draw or get a cintiq where you're actually drawing on the screen fundamentally will change how you now you'll get it and you'll be Frustrated as I'll get out for about five days while your hand or brain learn how to do it. But if you stick with it, it fundamentally changes how you edit a photograph, how you approach editing a photograph. How? And Why? Tell me more. I, I think it's because the experience of it being a pen and we touch on the tablet on the screen where we want to edit. And so the brain is now not moving a mouse across the screen to make the work. It's actually physically touching the spot on the screen that maps to the keyboard or the, the tablet, that that mapping makes the editing process more uh, in our brains seem more, uh, I don't know if it's a control or if it's just we have a, a, a again, a more tactical re or tactile relationship to it because we're, we're we feel like we're actually touching the point on the screen where we're making the edit versus our hand on the mouse, which is moving the thing around. So I, there's just something in that, in that, in that world. The other piece with the digital print, uh, even if it's a digital print or a C print you get from some, some company, the other piece that printing does and I, is it makes you commit to the work. The thing I, I hear too, when people complain about printing, they complain about cost and I'm like, Okay, so it costs like two dollars to get an eight by ten made, and you just spent twenty six thousand dollars on a whole new Sony system. Like, really? So it can't be cost because photographers waste money like nobody does. Um, but the other one I realized is when we print and we put it on the wall, we've made a statement that we believe that is at a state of being completed, and now all sins are revealed. Because if it's in the computer, I can still change it. But as soon as I put it to paper, it can't. And so now I can edit and print and edit and reprint and do all that whole loop. But I do think in a lot of photographers, there's that sense of, of well, if I commit and I say it's finished and people don't like it or I don't like it, what does that actually mean? Um, and then the other one is that I always laugh about is when we print things and put them on the wall, we see different. You'll see every problem you have. You'll see everything great in the photograph. And the other one is I've never known anybody to get excited when somebody says, hey, let me show you this you know, on my phone. Let me show you this photograph. And they're like, oh, that's pretty cool. Or if you hand them a print and then it goes on the wall and then they live with that and they have that experience over and over again, that is fundamentally different. And like you said, it's not better or worse. It's just different. And why not give yourself the opportunity to have both experiences? I mean, that's to me live with the print, see what it looks like. You might find out you, you love prints, you love printing. They, and it makes a huge difference in how you see, see work and look at photographs, um, you know, different. You walk into museums now, you see digital installations, but we, we visually associate to those differently than we do a photo book or a photo print or, or something like that. Do you equate your self-worth with your prints? I would like to say, no, I don't. I would like to, <laughs> uh, but I, 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 I am very attached into the, the, my, my, my print work. Um, and I do believe that, you know, part of the selection curation editing process speaks to who I really speaks to who I am. Because when I go to, by the time I made the decision to print and particularly print large, I've now made the decision of I've called selected 
edited, done the best I can, and now printed it, that if that's not, if that ultimately the final print of that doesn't meet the bar, yeah, I really like something's gone way, way wrong. So yeah, I, I, I would love to believe I'm, I'm above that, but no, no, I'm, I'm definitely in that bottom of that trough. <laughs> and that's, and that's why we do what we do because we value it. Yeah. It, you know, and, um, Daniel, it's been such a pleasure to have this conversation. I mean, you, you listen to your podcast and uh, the perceptive photographer, and it's just, you're just constantly, you are full of insight and thoughts around this life that so many of us love to live in the world of photography. Uh, so let everybody know where they can find you, follow you, subscribe to the podcast, all of that. So the podcast is the Perceptive Photographer Podcast, and it's up on all the major podcast platforms. You can just find it there. Uh, my website is danieljgregory.com, and you can get podcasts and newsletter and workshop information there. And on pretty much anywhere on social media, it's Dan Greg Photo. So on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, it's all all there. And my uh, the other website we do have is sillydogstudios.art, um, and that's where all of our herbal products and stuff live up there as well. So that's kind of the, the world we live in up there for Lori and I in our little studio. Which I can highly recommend and vouch for. I use this uh, this hand um, lotion bar that Lori wow. makes like every day and it smells good. <laughs> yeah, no, she's, uh, yeah, she's crazy with that. She's kind of like me. She's a single plant. You respect what the plant offers, how the plant works. And so, yeah, we're, we're good peas in a pod in that regard. I love it. I love it. Well, what a pleasure. I wanted to give some shout outs before we sign off. Uh, we had Doug from Indianapolis, Margie from uh, Columbia, South Carolina, Rome, Pleasanton, California, Lima, Peru, uh, Utah, Northern Ireland, the Caribbean, and Campo Grande, Brazil. So wow. thank you to everybody who's tuning in from all over the world. We are all in this life of photography and creativity together. Uh, so everyone, again, if you haven't already, you can subscribe, rate, and review our podcast. We are photographers, again, uh, wherever it is that you get your streams and podcasts. And we highly encourage you to check out what else is coming up here on Creative Live TV, uh, as we are always playing something new and live, uh, live interviews, performances, all kinds of things um, to keep us all connected. So signing off, but once again, thank you so much to Daniel Gregory, and we will see you all next time. feeling isolated and looking for creative connection try tuning into creativelive.com slash tv that's where we've got a 24 7 live stream from the kitchen counters i can do that back lit shot that i really like to do from the studios and living rooms of many of the world's top creators where we're doing musical performances q a's cooking shows virtual book tour events drawing spoken word poetry and more Pass me by waiting for an invitation when the world is greater than my nation or my occupation. Be someone you've never been. You feel all that adrenaline, it's medicine. It actually helps me feel like my days are more purposeful. I hope that out of this deep pain will come some collective growth. Dive into Creative Live TV today. Hey guys, what's up? It's Chase Jarvis, founder and CEO of Creative Live. You all know that we have more than 2,000 classes and more than 10,000 hours of learning, inspirational, and motivational content on the platform. I'm super excited to announce a new experience on Creative Live. It's called Fast Class. 
You've told us that you're busy and sometimes it's hard to dive into a full class from start to finish. So essentially we're now giving you a shortened highlight version of our top creative live classes. You can always dive into the full class with five, 10 or 15 hours of great content. But now if you're just looking to focus on a few of the highlights or wanna be able to skip quickly to something that really interests you, you can now get a shortened fast class version of that class. We're also thinking this might be able to help you explore a new craft and save time while doing it. This is a great tool to curate your learning experience to help create the life that you seek. So you're probably thinking, great, how do I access this new experience on Creative Live? That's easy. All you have to do is be a subscriber to the Creator Pass and then all this is yours.